we are live. Thanks, Matt. Um, welcome everyone to the March 16th Finance Committee meeting. Jenny, would you call the roll? Mr. Keeler? Here. Ms. Aludo? Here. Mr. Peterson? Here. Great, thank you. Um, first thing on our agenda is approval of the February 17th um, meeting minutes. Did everyone have a chance to look at them? Any corrections need to be made? All right, I will take a motion to approve the minutes. I'll second. Jenny? Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Keeler? Yes. Mr. Ludo? Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, the first discussion item on our, I, it just logged me out. That's so awesome. <laughs> Hold on, let me see if I can log back in the board pack. Matt, uh, I, I think the first thing is the Bridge Park um, new community. Are you leading that one? Yes, Councilmember Ludo, that is the first item on the agenda, and I can start the presentation on that. Let's go there while I try to figure out how to log myself back in. <laughs> Great. Um, I'll begin sharing my screen here, but I'll start with the first item on the agenda is the Bridge Park NCA discussion. And we do have three board members of the Bridge Park NCA discussion here today to uh, uh, meet with the Finance Committee and, and have this discussion. And we chose three board members because any more would actually have a quorum of that board and, and we didn't want to do that. So. In attendance today, we have Rick Schwederman, the chair of the NCA board, Lynn Reedley, the treasurer of the board, and Allison Srail, a developer appointed representative of the board. So I'd like to introduce them all to the finance committee. I'm going to go through a short high level presentation and then set up some potential topics for discussion and, and have an open forum for the committee members of the committee and the NCA board to uh, have a conversation and, and begin uh, discussing you know, items of interest. So we will already, uh, the agenda for the committee meeting is as stated in the uh, announcement that went out. So we'll cover that a little bit later, but basically the NCA board follows a statutory authority to encourage orderly development in a well-planned diversified economically sound community. This community can exist of industrial, commercial, residential, educational and recreational facilities. Uh, it's important to note that the new community authority is a separate public body governed by this board of trustees that oversees this development. Um, it has 7 to 13 members. A majority of the members are appointed by city council. There are at least 3, but no more than 6 of these members and the developer um, appoints uh, a number of members equal to the number of citizen members. Um, there's also a local government representative. That is the odd representative that uh, is appointed by the city. Current members of the board of trustees, as we stated here tonight, Rick Schwederman is the chair, Lynn Reedley is the treasurer. We also have Sharon Tackett and AC Strip is the local government representative. So these are the city appointed members of the board. The developer, uh, developer appointed members of the board include Matt Starr, who acts as the committee's vice chair, Allison Srail, and Jeff Roberts. Some of the other companies that support the board, you may have heard of, but I wanted to kind of identify their role in how they support the board. Um, the legal representation for the board is provided by Bricker and Eckler, specifically Rob McCarthy and Prince Finley are involved in the board's operations. There's also something known as the calculation agent in the packet for this meeting. You probably saw the calculation agent report. That is the annual report that details the revenues and expenditures of the NCA board. This is performed by DePerna and advisors, and they are uh, an employee. They are employed by the board. Uh, specifically, you'll see Josiah Huber and Mike Novak as the uh, individuals that uh, work closely with the NCA board. And then the board also employs Clark Schaefer Hackett for auditing, accounting, and tax collection. Uh, specifically, uh, some of the sales tax and early. Um, New community charges for the 1st year of properties are handled by Clark Schaefer Hackett. So they're involved in some of those uh, processes. Additionally, there are city staff that support the operations of the board and rep, uh, represent the city and attend these board meetings. Uh, predominantly, they have been uh, the finance director, which is me. 
I am assisted by our contractual employee or contractual uh, representation from Squire Patton and Boggs, and that's Greg Daniels. He works closely with me to represent the city um, before this board. So that kind of explains the who and the, and some of the how behind that. The powers of the board, the board has um, several powers, some of which are used more often than others in our, uh, in this NCA's case. It has the power to purchase property, improve and sell property in community facilities, provide recreational, educational, health, social, and cultural activities for the residents of the district. Those have not been the primary activities of uh, the Bridge Park NCA. The primary activities of the Bridge Park NCA have been these uh, second three. That's to collect service fees to cover the community development program, to enforce collection of the community development charge, issue debt and to pay the operation and maintenance of community facilities. Those are what you'll see in the calculation agent report that the Bridge Park NCA has predominantly been involved in. So at this point, that kind of concludes my short high level overview. I wanted to give every board member an opportunity to make some opening remarks before we opened it up for discussion. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to the chair. Rick, are you still there? Okay, you hear me there now? You go. Ah, sorry about that. I, I don't know how I did that, but um, one of the items that uh, really jumped out to me was uh, the point here that uh, an NCA, and this is the definition, uh, a separate public body governed by uh, a board of trustees, which we have, uh, and uh, that may oversee, may uh, oversee the development of public infrastructure improvements in community facilities. And I think you then went through and then detailed the charges uh, of what um, th this particular NCA and at least this stage of its activities are primarily involved in the, the last, uh, the, the uh, last three of those uh, uh, powers. Uh, the collection of service fees, enforcement of collection and uh, issue debt uh, and and, uh, and then pay the cost of operations, maintenance, et cetera. I would agree with those. There are, I believe, people in our community that really believe the NCA is responsible and oversees um, uh, the, the development activity of Bridge Park, which really is not the case. And um, and so at least as I always understood uh, the the responsibilities that we have with regard to uh, the Bridge Park project. And Lynn, do you kind of touched on this from time to time? You have any other thoughts on that? Uh, you've got to uh, mute. Yes. Very good. Okay. Sorry. It's always always a problem. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So I, I'm Lynn Reedy. Uh, I have been. I think I actually uh, am a, a founding board member from 2015, and um, so we've seen the whole kind of growth and movement of this really remarkable project. Um, and you know, looking back at our formal meeting agendas and resolutions, you can see that, you know, since 2015, we, we've not in any one calendar year, we've not met more than three times, you know, perhaps once we've met more than three times and that and that the function uh, largely uh, in those meetings relate to the very points that Rick was mentioning. So, you know, we set the budget for the NCA, we set the charges for the coming calendar year. We take um, if, uh, action on uh, agreements as necessary when the block funding and financing comes up. And then we, you know, uh, uh, attend to admin administrative details of, of uh, the NCA as an entity. And that is, um, and I, and I think uh, not only did Rick men mention this, but Matt mentioned this too, and that so that's really where uh, our our function has largely focused is the assessment of these fees, the uh, 
uh, calculation of charges, and then uh, overseeing the distribution of those, in which we evaluate then on an annual basis uh, uh, through um, uh, annual financial reporting. For example, we just uh, we just had submitted on March 1, the 2020 financial report for the NCA, which as everybody knows, you know, the NCA budget is a very small piece of the entire Bridge Park development budget. But in the course of that, you know, we are um, updated uh, by the developer uh, at each meeting and obviously have uh, uh, information uh, that we uh, have access to throughout the year to uh, to kind of observe uh, uh, what is happening with respect to the to the progress of the project. So I have I have used the term sort of guardrails in terms of you know we're sort of, we could have sort of function and we're yeah. one of three major entities um, uh, that really oversee this the city the NCA and the uh, financing uh, district. And, and so we're sort of that those guardrails for the assessments and the disbursement of those assessments. Rick, I'm gonna jump back to you and not talk. Okay. Um, uh, well, um, <clears throat> does, does anybody else have any thoughts or reactions to um, those points of view? I would just say thank you to for both of you. Um, I think it was a great summary and great perspective. And I, I uh, agree with Rick that there is a misconception out there that you do a lot more than you do. Uh, so thanks for setting the record straight there. And thank you for the work that you do. Um, Matt, there's another presentation. Are you going to go through the second presentation? on the NCA as well, because I do have questions about that. I, I don't plan on going through that, but I have the slides. We can bring them up and talk about them. If you're talking about the uh, financing structure presentation that was uh, part of council's discussion last September, we can certainly we can certainly have that conversation as well. OK, whenever whenever you are already to move on. Do you have a, screen that, a slide that has some questions on it that you wanted us to address? Sure, I'll, I'll put up my uh, slide for sharing again. So it's it's this the the one that I have questions on is the um it's not the listed as the presentation. It's listed as Bridge Park NCA information. And as Matt kind of alluded to, it's got various mechanisms for funding. And I just had a real, real quick question on that. And then I think you should ask it. Okay. So, um, I think it's uh, maybe slide three. Examples of economic development tools available to municipalities, tips, payroll incentives and grants, community reinvestment areas, and new community authorities. So the third one, community reinvestment areas, we've got two listed here, Britain Parkway and Tuttle Crossing. Do you by chance have the boundaries of those? Um, I think there's a, um, a question as to whether one of those two probably, um, well, it, the understanding is that the historic district is within a CRA. It clearly wouldn't be either of these two CRAs, um, but perhaps there's another CRA out there that encompasses the historic district. Council Member Keeler, I'll have to get back with you on that. I don't have the boundaries of either of those, and I don't know that this is an exhaustive list of CRAs or not, but I will research that and get back with you. Fine, thank you. I don't know. All right, so um, Matt's put up some just potential um, topics for discussion. Um, 
And the, the, the first one is, I think, it's a great question. How can the Bridge Park NC and the city improve communication? Um, frankly, I think um, having this quick refresher on what an NCA is and isn't um, is really helpful. Um, Certainly, I think it's something that we that should be done at least every two years when the council members that are on finance committee cycle in and out. Because um, that's sort of our cadence. Now, you'll have crazy people like me who will stay on finance committee as long as they will let me because I like it. Um, but not everybody's like that. So um, I think it is helpful to, to have that be a part of sort of that every two year cycle so that anyone who may be new on finance committee can understand exactly what an NCA is, what its purview is and what it is not. I also, uh, if Council Member Aludo, I, I also uh, have been thinking over the years that you know we've got these three principal entities we've got the city and we've got the nca and we've got the finance authority um but we don't probably have enough uh direct reporting from the nca a nca to i'm thinking about the tournament i guess but from the nca to um to council itself and uh, one recommendation i would make is that perhaps um, twice a year, twice a year, uh, the N NCA make a presentation, summary presentation to council of activities of the year, issues, the, the kinds of things you're inquiring about right now, um, I think would, uh, would would be helpful all around. Yeah, Lynn, I think that's a great idea and there's certainly precedent set for that. Um, you know, we, we certainly have other groups that, that Come to us on a regular basis throughout the year. Sometimes it's once a year, sometimes it's quarterly. Um, I think your recommendation of twice a year for this group makes some really good sense um, to come to council and just say, hey, here's what we've been working on. Here's issues that we're seeing. Um, because it also gives council an opportunity to say, great, you know, how can we help you? So right. what what has been the past practice as far as the uh, communications on the status of uh, uh, Bridge Park and, and, and NCA or just Bridge Park? In other words, uh, you reflect back in this last September, there was uh, um, a concern about one, one, uh, some funding that potentially needed. Is there... Are there touch points along the way that kind of serve to really brief the the, the committee on on where things are and that type of thing is that or is it just when we have an issue come up or we have a financing uh, uh, of a block uh, what's what's the touch points that you have on your agenda during the course of the year so we don't I don't think and Matt you can correct me if I'm wrong but I don't think we have any structured um, touch points that we say, okay, throughout the year, we're going to check in and see how things are going. I mean, Matt will always bring things to us if there are items that the NCA needs for us to think about or to consider. Um, so Matt's certainly really been the liaison there. Okay. Um, and I think that overall that's okay, but I, I really like the idea of the NCA coming and presenting to council a couple times a year in a little bit more of a formal way. Um, you know, we, we certainly do that with um, Visit Dublin, Ohio. Um, we do that with the Arts Council. You know, we do that with some of our other um, entities that we talk with. And we certainly get committee reports from our other committees, whether they're council committees or um, boards and commissions. Um, we, we've actually started to do that a little bit more with our boards and commissions in terms of having um, some touch points with them that we've not had in the past. Um, and they kind of ebb and flow too, depending on what the will of council is at the time. Okay. Um, so that's been sort of, there hasn't been a real cadence to it, if you will. Um, but I think it'd be really helpful for us to start one. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, uh, <clears throat> then I think that underscores even further the, uh, um, the, the, uh, recommendation that Lynn made. Yep. I, I agree. I mean, you know, this NCA was formed just shortly before I was elected to council, and I remember getting a little bit of a crash course right after I was elected, along with the three million other bits and bytes of information they were trying to stuff into my head. And um, poor Andy did the same thing last year, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it would be super helpful, if, especially 
you know, now that we have a mechanism to get to this kind of material more easily, mm -hmm. um, you know, even if it is somebody who's a new council member or new on finance committee, they, they could go back and take a look at the reports from the previous year, those two reports or the previous two years and kind of get an idea pretty quickly of the things that you guys are working on. Um, and I think that'd be really helpful. So I think this is a fantastic suggestion. Lynn. You know, another, um, uh, Another example of that, and, and both you and Rick have already alluded to that, though, but, you know, we have this kind of functioning year over year functioning up until uh, 2020, and then we have this uh, COVID hiccup. And, you know, we had a chance because everything was virtual. So we had a chance to just, you know, log in and watch the council meeting and the amount of work. And it was so obvious, you know, how yeah. much. Uh, each one of the council members had to drill down into this, you know, to make the decision that 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 they made. And so I think keeping keeping it fresh uh, it would help, you know, when we when we encounter those those bubbles. And, and yeah, agreed. Uh, agreed. So how do you guys feel like the Bridge Park NCA is functioning? You think things are going well? Mm -hmm. I, I we I I would say that I believe we're accomplishing what is uh, intended um, and um, and fulfilled those responsibilities. Um, the most difficult thing is what we've alluded to, and is the level of complexity is such that even twice a year, it's it's tough to really. Uh, uh, maintain a freshness there on, uh, on on what has occurred and 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 what is being planned and that type of thing. You know, someone like Allison, obviously, she lives with it day to day, and right. so <laughs> and, and those folks and uh, and she and Matt, they they're just I mean they're on top of it and they they know it very very well. So that becomes they become the resource really to the NCA about, okay, what's the status of all the various block activities in the various uh, um, um, potential requirements as far as additional funding and that type of thing. Um, mm -hmm. that, that, that's mm -hmm. Lynn or Allison? I mean, I do, uh, I do agree with that. And I think, you know, for, one problem is the NCA tool, although it's been used before, it's not it's not frequently used. And so there's not too many to compare to to see, you know, what's a better functioning NCA? What's a better way to do it? But, you know, our experience has been, you know, I think largely positive. So and, and you know, the example I hold in my head is we haven't had to go back for additional assessments. We haven't had to, you know, change the rates, which has been great. For the for the residents, you know, it's and and even in very difficult times, we haven't gotten there. And so, I do think I do agree that you know Allison and her colleagues at at uh, Crawford Hoying, uh, you know, they they are responsible. And it's another reason I kind of like the NCA format. You know that you know they're responsible for bringing to the table an incredible amount of information. And um, and that in itself is a check and, and a kind of a again kind of a guardrail to make sure that that everybody knows you know the the, the project is moving uh, a pace and so I, I really do I do credit the uh, effort that uh, that they make to um, pull all of this information together and and because it just simply has to function as a partnership it has to function as a partnership and. And that's not always easy with such a mountain of detail that uh, that they're having to work through. And I'll just no, add to that. I think I'm just going to speak. I can't wave my hand. I'm waving my hand, but you guys can't see me waving it. So I'm just going to start talking. But um, go for it. You know, I, I think that du Dublin is a community uh, where people expect their government to work. They expect people to be responsible. They expect people to have integrity. Um, there are expectations that they have. Uh, and and they don't have to they they don't feel as though it is their job to babysit the the staff or the council or the the volunteers in our community to run run the city and so when it came to this uh, the NCA and its creation and all that so much of the mission was accomplished by creating it in the first place as long as we were effective in in appointing the appropriate 
uh, on at least the citizen representatives uh, appointing the right people uh, on that side of the equation, because the very existence you are there and you are watching serves the purpose. And I'm going to flatter you because I want to thank you, but I also want to flatter you because it accomplishes our goal. When you have four people like we do in Sherry Tackett and Ace and Rick and Leonard, when you have the integrity and the reputation, the professional presence that you do, the executive high level, high functioning person who is willing to sit and pay attention to what's going on, that, that serves our purpose for the balance of our community. They are comfortable knowing that you are comfortable watching. And so, no matter how much you are, you know, there aren't meetings three times a month or, or however, however many meetings there are and whatever topics you address, the functioning executive integrity and reputation of the people that are doing the review serves the purpose of instilling confidence in this community that the community's interests are being watched. So I thank you very much uh, for your service. I know you really bask in um, enormous salaries uh, that you are paid <laughs> to do this sort of thing. Uh, Ask you. <laughs> <laughs> that checks in the mail in, don't worry. It'll get there, it'll eventually get there. Um, you know, it is a, it is a, a, a huge value and service that you provide to our community because Bridge Park as a whole was a tremendous undertaking from the very beginning. And it amazes me when I drive, I don't know why this happens at night, especially at night, and it's with the bridge. When you when you drive down uh, through the historic district and you look over at what's there now, and none of that was there maybe six years ago. I don't know, Matt, I don't know how long since the shovels went in the ground, but it is an incredible amount of work and development and everything else that the developers have done in Crawford Hoying, everything on the Allison side of the equation here and what they have done is truly amazing. And you guys sitting in that seat, paying attention, um, I think instills that confidence in our community that that uh, it, it is it is being done right. So I thank you very much for your being there. It is extremely important that you are there and you're serving your function just by having your name on the agenda. I think um, I'm not raising my hand very well, but you know the very it's is it a very interesting point. The very nature of the structure creates accountability, which is exactly what council wants to have. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, too, it, it's a very complex um, arrangement that's there, and so I think to have this committee really looking over it and you know working hand in hand with with uh, Crawford Hoyne and, and Allison and her team, I think is really important. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that leads us sort of to our next question. Do you all have concerns about um, the the financing structure as it sits today? Or do you think you're going to have some concerns in the future? What are those and how can we help address those? Mm -hmm. You guys want me to jump in on that one? Yeah, yeah. So I think right now we're looking to 2021 and what our development plan is going to be. You probably have seen uh, plans moving forward for D block. Um, so as it relates to future development, we feel good about rounding out um, G block, F block, and the balance of H block um, and moving all of those forward this year. Mm. Uh, the existing bonds are, are back in good place as we continue to stabilize the development and the top comes back online. We're not projecting any huge issues right now, um, but we are going to continue to review those numbers on a frequent basis, um, particularly as it relates to the A block bonds. So we have some advanced warning if we have some issues there. Great. Thank you, Allison. I really appreciate that. Uh, Rick or Lynn, any, any comments to top off Allison? Well, I'd be... Uh... I, I think the the uh, a touch point along the way here, uh, along the lines that Allison highlighted, will be very very beneficial. You know, I I don't think there's anything broken here. To be quite honest with you, I think if I were to, uh, I've I've told people I said the I think the NCA in this particular uh, way of financing uh, public private development, I think it's worked quite well. I think it's very it's it's served the community quite well. 
Uh, yes, it is complicated, but you know, um, sometimes uh, uh, big things take complexity. <laughs> Not everything's simple. Uh, and uh, you just look at all the activities of uh, the city government. I mean, there's a lot of moving parts there. And this is, uh, this is part of it. And the development activity is key. Um, and uh, uh, so I, I wouldn't say other than the communications on more of an interim basis, um, I don't think there's any problems or concerns that I would share. Mm -hmm. Other uh, thoughts? I mean, I would, I would simply add to that. You know, it's like it should go can without. Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Ah, there it goes. I had it. I don't know what happened. My speakers and everything just went like dead. <laughs> everything. I was like, oh no. <laughs> My apologies, Rick. I probably missed the last part of what you said. <laughs> oh, uh, I was uh, essentially um, uh, summarizing in that I, I believe that the um, Bridge Park uh, NCA structure, I would not recommend that there are problems that have to be fixed. Uh, I think it's worked quite well. Um, I've shared with community people that it's been very, very effective. Um, most people really uh, don't appreciate the amount, uh, the magnitude of everything going on and the complexity, but that's that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, we certainly thank you for for um, all of your attention and um, in working on this. It's I I think it has been a really excellent partnership. Um, Andy, quick question. Quick question regarding, I guess, timing, scheduling, um, accountability, check-ins, and that kind of stuff. Um, other than the NCA meetings, does the NCA board receive ongoing, let's say, biannual reporting from Allison, uh, either in report form or in presentation form? Mm -hmm. It's really more it has been really on an as needed basis and it really has um, uh, dovetailed with uh, the development activities. Wouldn't you say that's the case, Allison? Yeah, so the way that we've structured it in the past and the three to four meetings happen organically based on our development schedule. So once we have a plan that we can review with the NCA board that's actionable, is when we'll typically get together. And so those meetings will entail a full bridge park update. We'll talk through any structural issues we might need, and then we'll dive into a specific financing request mm -hmm. outside of the annual meeting, which happens to approve the budgets. Would it, would it make sense to have, say, uh, a January and July check-in? Um, and then have a February and um, August meeting, and then a March and uh, September report to council or report to the finance committee. I mean, I, I like to have kind of things scheduled out just so I know that I'm not missing anything. And it would seem to me that it, if it makes sense, and maybe it doesn't, but if you could set up systematic review date, um, then we would kind of know when to expect that kind of reporting to come. The only issue that I see with that, sorry, Lynn. No, I'm, I'm going to guess what you're going to say. Um, <laughs> the, the, you know, how the uh, bond financing comes together is not on a rigid timetable. And so we have had experiences Council Member Keeler, where we where we set a meeting, but they had to move the meeting to you know to accommodate you know the changes in financing. But I think your point about a cadence is really a good a really a good point, and we've we've talked about that uh, uh, on the NCA board as well. And I and I just wanted to quickly add, you know, we do have the uh, calculation agent report, which is uh, a summary that 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 comes to us and that. Uh, and, and I find that a very helpful written summary of the, the status of the project. So I think I think Matt, you mentioned that in the opening comments. But Allison, now that I've talked over you, 
go for it. <laughs> we were on the same page. I think um, we do have one set meeting a year. We have our annual review where we're setting the charges. It could be beneficial to add just another check in maybe in January um, to offset that. And those could become our two reporting periods back to council. Um, could be a way that we would look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sense, I will leave it to you, um, you guys maybe to communicate with Matt about what you think makes the most sense and you guys can decide that at your next meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and if we can create a regular, a little bit more of a regular schedule, that would be awesome because then it also helps Matt too, because he knows when he's supposed to bring stuff back to finance committee and then mm -hmm. we can just wrap it in our finance committee report to council. Um, and then if council has something specific that they want to pull out, they could do that. Um, and then, but I still think it would be worthwhile to have um, the um, to have you know one or two of you um, on the on the board come in and actually present to council, and maybe the presentation pieces once a year, but the update pieces are to finance committee twice a year. That might make a little bit more sense. Yeah. Cool. So I'm going to let you guys work amongst yourselves and with Matt to to figure out what makes the most sense for you and for your meeting schedule. Um, and then Matt can just report back to us and let us know what y'all come up come up with if that's okay. Sure, uh, Allison. Is there any interval uh, interval that? Sorry, he broke up for me. Did he break up for you? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, is, is there a um, regularly scheduled reporting requirement from the Franklin County Authority Finance Authority? It is they, an annual reporting requirement. Just an annual. Okay, that's why yep. I was guessing. Okay. And then, so finally, um, how else can can the city or city staff um, support you? I'll jump in on that one. I think meetings like today are super important and you know, I know when we had the conversations last summer we were all wishing we had been a little bit more proactive yeah. and uh, I think that would have helped that conversation along so I appreciate your guys' time today and just continuing to talk about it so it becomes a more natural part of the conversation we all feel better informed yeah I think you make a great point Allison in that regard Could we I think get another I three days a month from Matt <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, I think if we could clone Matt, we would. But he's got, but he has Rosa now, right? And part of, I think, with Matt is just getting fully staffed. Um, and and then I think Matt can maybe take a little bit of a, of a breath of of relief because I know he's been up to his eyeballs. So, well, the one the one thing I would uh, observation I would share is, uh, you know. Uh, so, uh, Greg Daniels is very, very knowledgeable about everything with the NCA and, and Bridge Park uh, and um, as uh, legal counsel to, to the city. Uh, the only person in the city who really has a depth of understanding uh, as a city employee is Matt. So, um, you know, he's... Uh, He's a critical guy here, and um, and that uh, it's been a learning curve um, uh, since uh, he took over after Angel uh, left. And so, you know, we're, if I were to identify a risk aspect, uh, is that you're not real deep as far as internal knowledge about uh, Bridge Park and the NCA. It's just in, in part because of the nature of the beast. But that's just a, uh, that's, I think, just a factual reality. Yeah, Rick, I think you make a really good point. And I think that that's something that um, a, a lot of um, agencies struggle with from time to time, especially when you're short staffed, is, is having the, the bench strength, particularly yeah. when you're talking about, um, you know, an entity that's as complex as, as, as a new community authority is, and this one in particular. Um, you know, and I, I mean, that's something that Matt will have to think about um, as 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 he gets fully staffed in terms of figuring out how to do that knowledge transfer with his staff. So that if he wins the lottery, I never say hit by a bus. I think that's a, like just asking for trouble. So if he wins the lottery, you know we don't get left behind with with all of that institutional knowledge walking out the door. Yes. Yep. But also, if I may add, in together. Sorry. 
was going to say for now, don't let Greg and Matt drive together. <laughs> right. What were you going to say, Megan? Sorry, Chris. I was just going to say that in my new role, I'll be working very closely with finance and development um, areas, and I'm planning on getting up to speed and more knowledgeable about um, these tools as well. So um, I'm working closely with Matt. A little uh, light nighttime reading in case you have yeah. trouble sleeping. How long is how how long is the original agreement? It's like seven hundred pages or something. <laughs> so you have fun with that, Megan. I will. <laughs> I will. Awesome. Well, let's definitely keep the lines of communication open. I think this was really helpful. Andy or Greg, you have anything else you want to add about this particular topic? No, I'm good. Thank you, everyone. Excellent. I, I would just add, I think Rosa is um, trying to step up to the plate a bit here too, right, Matt? So. Yeah, absolutely. I, I wanted to just address that as one of the things, you know, having been in the interim role, uh, noticing that there wasn't a lot of capacity was one of the first things I noticed. And we absolutely are taking steps to build capacity. You'll see everyone on this call, and that's not an accident. And, you know, we're going to, Good. Build, build more capacity every day more than yesterday, and, and we should be in a good place by tomorrow. That's the goal. That's awesome. That's what we like to see. All right. All right. Well, I really appreciate all the time here. Yeah, we're, I mean, we're happy to do it. I, I love this stuff. I think it's fascinating. I think it's fun. Um, I know Greg's probably rolling his eyes at me right now, if I could see his eyes. Um, <laughs> But uh, we really appreciate your time as well and all of your effort. Um, so thanks for everything that you do. I think you guys have a really well high functioning group um, and it's really served um, the, the new community authority really well. Um, so thanks a bunch. Let's keep the lines of communication open. I'll let you guys touch base with Matt to figure out what kind of schedule works for you as far as coming in, I think once a year to um, present to all of council and then maybe a couple of update reports throughout the year that would come to finance committee. And then we can kind of report those out to council. I think that'd be fantastic. Um, but certainly if there's anything that comes up in the interim um, that you feel needs to um, at least be addressed by finance committee, just work with Matt. We have quite a few meetings on the schedule this year. I feel like we're making up for lost time from last year. <laughs> so, um, uh, but but we've done that purposefully so that as we have topics that we need to discuss, we have the time set aside to do that. Um, so always feel free to, to to talk with Matt, reach out, or reach out to me. Um, uh, we're, we'd be happy to, to to sit down and chat with you guys. Great. I think one thing we'll suggest, Christina, is our next round of public financing coming just with a bullet point summary for this group ahead of any council meetings, so you guys can ask some in depth questions. I think would be really helpful. I agree. Yeah. So that may be our next ad yeah. hoc meeting. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Great. All right. Anything else for the new community authority discussion? I would just wish everybody a happy St. Patrick's Day for tomorrow. You too, Rick. Thank you. Um, you guys are certainly welcome to hang out if you'd like to for the balance of the meeting, but you do not have to. If you if you start to drop off, I completely understand. Understood. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Thank Thanks. you. Have a good evening. Bye bye. All right, Matt, we are on to topic number two, first quarter revenues. I'm going to let you or Rosa or whomever you want take it away. Absolutely. I'm going to share my screen, but Rosa is going to be handling this presentation. I wanted to thank Greg Daniels for attending real quick. I see him on the phone. Um, Hi, Greg. Thanks. I think you're muted. Yeah, I muted myself at some point mid soliloquy and I apologize. apologize. I was going to say that I'm going to share my screen and turn it over to Rosa. Thank you. That's okay. This is where we all just have to have a little bit of grace for everybody. It's just how it is. All right, Rosa, take it away. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Okay, I'm having connectivity issues, so I'm going to do my best to go through this today. But if I, if you cannot hear me, please let me know. Okay. Yeah, we catch it. You, we if you want to, Rosa, sometimes when you turn your camera off, it reduces your bandwidth and you can, the connection issues resolve a little bit. So you, you might want to try that. Okay, I will try that. Thank you. Okay. 
So we have a review of 2021 operating revenues, and I'll say year today um, only because obviously we're still going through the Q1. We have one month left, but starting with the income tax revenue, as you can see on this slide, as of the end of last month, income tax receipts total 15.3 million, and this is an increase of 4.5% over the same time in 2020. Or sorry, 2020. Um, our estimate and a budget was 1% over uh, 2020, so we are well ahead of that target. And as we move into the next slide, the general fund revenue, uh, just keep in mind that 75% of income tax receipts hit the general fund, and the other 25% goes to the capital income. Matt, are you showing the next slide? I have the general fund slide up. Can, can you not see it? I cannot see it. Let me know which slide you see. If anyone sees a slide. We're seeing the general fund revenue by category. Okay. So I can see it, yeah. Okay. So I don't see it, but I can talk to it. <laughs> I'm going to do my best. So on the operating um, budget general fund one on one revenues, you'll see that as of the end of the month, we were 1.69% above the same time in 2020. Again, primarily due to local taxes. Um, there are other line items where we have a negative variance as compared to the same period last year, and these are primarily due to charges for services, for example, is due to a decrease in cell fuel and compressed natural gas. Our main customers in that pocket are the Dublin school system and uh, Washington Township. So this is just basically due to how they were changing um, their business due to the pandemic and, and how that translated to, to those charges. And also under fines, licenses, and permits, this is due to a decrease of commercial inspections, plan reviews, electrical and plumbing inspections as well. So we are expecting that this will continue to go up as we transition into a post-pandemic um, setting. Do you have any questions about this slide? I don't think so. I think the thing that we want to keep our eye on the most, um, correct me if I'm wrong, is is really the 20 day rule and how that could eventually impact us um, once the injunction is lifted, what happens there um, as people either go back to work or don't go back to work. Yeah, Council Member Aludo, I, I completely correct. agree. Correct. And that will, yep. Yeah. We're watching that and we're working with economic development closely to do as much um, information gathering as we can. That's going to be a difficult uh, needle to thread, but we are we're, we're definitely aware of the problem and we're definitely doing what we can to uh, look into making sure that those estimates are as, are as precise as possible the second half of this year when we enter completely unknown territory, essentially. Yeah. yeah. All right. Great. Thank you. Okay, on the next slide, we have the recreation fund 225. Thank you. And um, this is showing you results by month, year over year. And if you look at the orange bars, this is 2021, it's our comparison to the previous years. And you can see that in January, we were um, below target again this is due to the limited services that were being provided during that time period and now in february you're seeing how we are now again kind of coming along and, and meeting those targets that compared to previous time periods the 2021 estimate for the recreation fund is 2 million we are expecting to hit that estimate are we continue to plan uh, additional activities in the summer there are more in alignment with those pre-pandemic uh, offerings. So we are expecting to meet the target there. Any questions this, about this fund? 
This is actually a little bit better than I expected, especially given the um, you know continued limited number of slots. Although I will say, you guys, the rec center is max maxing out the number of spots, um, pretty much every day, aren't they? I don't watch their foot traffic, but I know that they have been increasing. Whether they're at maximum yet or not, I don't know. But it, it's been steadily picking up. I've been pleasantly surprised by this revenue myself. Yeah. Correct. And I believe they're planning on offering like their regular summer camps and all the, the summer programming. So hopefully that will help to bring the, this fun along. The next slide is the hotel motel fund balance. Thank you, Matt. And again, this is just a reminder so that you can see that we have an unofficial minimum fund balance of around 2.5 million. Um, we are expecting that we would need a general fund transfer this year to stay within that minimum fund balance. And this is primarily due to lower hotel motel uh, taxes that we are receiving. And in the next slide, Matt, if you don't mind. So here again, you will see those uh, receipts month over month and 2021, January and February are not that far off of where we were in 2020. Uh, this is a 60% decrease in revenue as compared to 2019. And we are ho hoping again as more activities continue to occur in the summer and we go back to those pre-pandemic levels that we are going to see additional uh, revenues come in through this fund. Any questions here before I move to the next yeah. slide? I think the next slide gives you a little bit more information. Yeah, I've got a question on the previous slide. Okay, go ahead. Um, so the 2020 actual um, looks pretty pretty decent, really, right? I mean, we that was the thick of it. And we came out of it just barely okay. Um, 2021 projected though, it looks like we have a general fund transfer. So I guess I'm curious why you're less optimistic about 2021, if I'm reading it right. Um, you're less optimistic about 2021 than you were in 2020. Obviously the first two or three months of 2020 were very, very robust. So you kind of have to uh, um, compensate for that. But um, last I knew, at least the AC hotel was, I think at 65% occupancy already. So I'm curious about that. Thank you. That's a, that's a good question, Council Mark. Yeah, I think there are a number of factors that kind of slice into this a little bit. You identified one, 2020 was essentially three bad quarters in one normal quarter. Now we're gonna have four bad, so that's part of the story. The second part of the story is we're fully supporting, um, we're subsidizing both the Arts Council and Visit Dublin, Ohio this year, whereas last year we subsidized Visit Dublin, Ohio from the general fund. So that's about $300,000 difference that if we were to do it the way we're doing it in 21, would have been a fund balance hit to the uh, hotel motel fund. So that's a difference. Another difference is at least at this point in the budget process, and I think we're going to have some future conversations on this, but for modeling purposes, we're assume, assuming a normal Irish festival. And we generally assume for budgeting purposes that the Irish festival is a little bit of a loser. It ends up being relatively revenue neutral but I would not be surprised if for budgeting purposes, our revenues are exceeded by our expenditures relative to having a normal festival. So that brings down your projected fund balance just a little bit. And you start stacking them and you're seeing a half a million dollars, three quarters of a million dollars. Um, whether all those things come to fruition, you know, we don't know. I think the Irish festival is a, a huge question mark in terms of its financial viability compared to a normal year that's that's outstanding still. So those are the factors that are leading us here on this graph and, and we're going to continue to work through and have these discussions as we kind of refine what that bar does does in fact look like. It's good to be conservative. 
Yeah, I think so too. And I think Matt, this is definitely one of the funds that we're going to want to um, kind of hear you and, and Rosa reporting on, I think periodically throughout the year, probably more frequently than other funds, um, just because of what you just said. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, this is going to be a conversation as we move into the second quarter. We're going to have another conversation with visit Dublin, Ohio on what their second half subsidy look like looks like. Another conversation with the arts council on their art and public places program. Another conversation on the Irish festival and all of that um, is going to impact this fund balance. And, you know, I, I, I try to be conservative in our budgeting. I don't want to have to come back for additional general fund transfer. So. Why, why do you ask for 1 and a half million during the budget? Because I don't want to come back and ask for 2. it's a lot easier at the end of the day to say, I only needed 1. So that's how we, we get to this point and we'll continue to keep you informed moving forward. Uh, that's going to be 1 of the goals of, of 2021 really. And if you just, move to, let, to the last slide, man, Oops, go ahead, go ahead. Sir, sorry, I just wanted to make one more comment since we're kind of talking about it and keeping keeping informed. I'm actually fairly encouraged by this bar graph because with the holiday travel and the highest spike in COVID, we were at our 60% budget, which to me is a is a pretty high floor. And it was what we budgeted. So we budgeted a 60 but a 60% average. And at a, what I hope is our worst point in this pandemic, we were at 60%. So as we start to emerge from this, to your point, uh, Council Member Keeler, with the Marriott being at 65% and stuff, we could be closer to 60% down the first half of the year, 40% down the second half of the year, which is actually the more important half anyway, and see really a pretty nice fund balance compared to what we budgeted. So that's also part of this that's kind of working in our favor is I, I'm actually pretty encouraged that what we budgeted was fairly conservative and the numbers do work still at this point. And, and I'm hopeful that we're moving to a, a better, more vibrant bed tax in the future. So Matt, do you recall um, back last year when you were doing, when we were like, what does this mean for our budget? And you sort of did this projection of worst case scenario kind of middle ground scenario and best case scenario. Um, what is the dark blue line representing here? Is that our best case scenario or is this the middle case scenario? Is that what you budgeted to? The orange is what we budgeted to. So that's the 60% decrease. And you can see that we were slightly behind it in January and right yep. at it in February. And you can also see that frankly, January and February are the least meaningful months and hopefully right. they were our worst months and we should proceed up from there. Um, we're just going to have to wait and see. There's just, you know, we're four months away from knowing what we want to know, really, and that's just frustrating, but that's the reality. You know, it is what it is. 2021 is going to be the year of, you know, adjusting. Yeah. My, my, my fear or my thought is as recreation and hotel motel start to improve, we could start to then see that remote work slippage in the income tax. And yep. that's saying now the reverse Yep. what it's been a fairly resilient pattern throughout this 12 month crisis pandemic emergency whatever word you want to use is going to be an interesting uh challenge to manage so we'll definitely be talking through that all right super thank you And and this last page is, is basically a summary of the conversation that we just had it just quantifies um, our estimates. So in 2021, we're expecting hotel motel tax to come in at 960,000, which is the, the negative 60% compared to 2019. Um, and we are right on target. Again, event administration, that's all still kind of up in the air, depending on what happens in the summer related to the Dublin Irish Festival and other activities. Great. Um Jenny, can you uh, get the presentation and get it up on board pack for us? Yes, I can. Thank you so much. Greg and Andy, you guys have any questions or comments? You know, I don't. I, the numbers are more encouraging than I think that I had been prepared to see. Um, and at the end of the day, this is this is this. <laughs> 
This is a bomb that exploded across the entire economy of the entire world, let alone the country and our, our, and our community here. So it's not like we're falling behind because we're not keeping up with other economies. You know, all of this is going to correct itself here in the next several months. Um, it, it's what's very comforting to me is that you're keeping track of all of this stuff with this kind of detail uh, to be able to show us where things are. And I, I think uh, I, I think the sun is beginning to shine again. This is really, we are really gonna start turning the corner here soon. Thanks, Andy, anything to add? Okay. No. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. So next on our agenda is the review of the Dublin Arts Council 2021 subsidy. Who's taking that one on? That's me. Excellent. Let's go. So I'm going to provide the quarterly updates that were part of the discussions we had when we did the uh, additional subsidies for the Arts Council, Visit Dublin, Ohio, and a discussion of the bed tax grant. We said we were going to review those quarterly. We don't have any additional applications to review today. But I just want to keep you guys informed so that when we meet on this in probably May again, we've had this discussion and we've had an interim look at at this topic. So um, keep hitting the arrow. There we go. With regards to the uh, Dublin Arts Council, as far as 2020 went, we made three hundred four thousand dollars in direct payments to them from the uh, hotel motel fund, and included fifty six thousand dollars in rent forgiveness in what was the um, a s additional subsidy from the city to the arts council. They had a budget in 2020 of um, $802,000 from the 25% of hotel motel tax funds of which they received uh, a little less than 300,000. So that 304,000 in direct payments um, and the 56,000 in rent forgiveness went a long way to getting them closer to their budget target in terms of direct cash. It was just over 600,000 and with the rent forgiveness, it had a total value of about 650,000 um, compared to their $802,000 budget. So they were down about 150,000 last year. In terms of 2021, we budgeted for a 60% decline again in this tax revenue that's consistent across all this. So we budgeted for 360,000 in hotel motel tax revenue to be distributed to them. And then we provided them uh, an additional uh, subsidy through a uh, reallocation of the arts and public places program for 2020 and 2021 through rent forgiveness and through uh, an additional subsidy to make up the difference to get us to the to a little budget number of about $700 a month. So $8,400 a year from the bed tax itself. So um, at to, to, to date, we've paid the, the Dublin Arts Council about $65,000 including the art and public places refunds and the rent forgiveness. And I'm available for any questions if, if there's any additional follow up on that. I don't think I have any Andy, Greg. Um, I just want to make sure I understand in 2020 actual was 600 826. That's what they received. Um, and the 2021 budget is 360. I should have been, I should have added one more line to that. Now that I look at it, it is confusing. So the 360 directly compares to the 296 above. Yep. Um, so we expect them to get a little bit more hotel motel tax revenue. In terms of subsidy, last year we gave them $304,000 in cash and yep. 56,000 in rent forgiveness. Um, in 2021, we're going to give them $150,000 in um, art in public places deferrals. So that's $150,000, 75,000 from 2020 and 75,000 from 2021, um, $84,000 in rent forgiveness, and then an additional $8,400 in additional funds from bed tax. So I don't have my calculator, but I should have totaled that up. It's a little over $240,000 I think was our subsidy towards um, the Arts Council. Um, I'm coming up with about 500 and about 600,000 total. That makes sense for a total budget, yeah. Okay, 
it was to keep them basically similar to where they were at last year. Okay. And that's what we'll review as part of the May conversation is where are we at compared to where we thought we would be? What do we want to do with the $300,000 in art in public places that um, is part of the public art plan, et cetera? And, and, and that conversation will happen in May. With regard to uh, visit Dublin, Ohio, in 2019, they had an actual um, actual payments from the hotel. Actually, it's not from the hotel motel fund; it's from an agency fund. But they had payments totaling about 1.26 million dollars. They had a 2020 budget going into the year when we didn't know what 2020 was of about 1.2 million dollars, and they ended up receiving just under 600 thousand dollars in hotel motel taxes. That does not include the $300,000 that they received as part of the Dublin restart plan that they used to spur the local economy. So they received total funding um, from the city for the restart plan and in terms of the, the lodging tax of just over $820,000. In 2021, um, because of the instability or the, the unknown nature of the hotel motel tax fund and the seasonal nature of the revenue, um, Visit Dublin, Ohio is really functioning on a six month schedule. So we did a six month subsidy with a reevaluation that we'll do in May as to, you know, what level of subsidy do we want to provide the second half of the year? So we budgeted again, a decline of 60% for $480,000. Um, we budgeted an additional subsidy through the first six months of the year of $173,000 or a little over 28,800 per month. And that's based on getting them to about a $400,000 budget for the first half of the year. So um, year to date, we've paid them a total of $231,000, um, which is slightly behind that $400,000 budget. Because as you recall, the first month in January, that bed tax was below our 60% a little bit. That's where we're a little bit behind on getting to that $400,000. So. Hopefully, as the uh, future months come in above 60%, um, we can we can make that up. Um, and I think that's all I have on this slide. If there are any questions, we will reevaluate this um, subsidy and this discussion at the May Finance Committee meeting with uh, Scott Nurig and Visit Dublin, Ohio. They'll be they'll be at the meeting to discuss what they've done, what they need, and and what your recommendation might be to council regarding a second half appropriation. Super, thanks. Greg or Andy, any questions or comments? Thank you, Greg. Hotel motel tax, just a quick update. I thought you would like to know where 2020 kind of ended because it kind of it's a little surprising. A lot of events were canceled, but we still ended up spending a significant amount of the hotel motel tax funding. Again, we budgeted 200,000. We actually spent just under 87,000 and we have another 30,000 encumbered. I know that 25,000 of that is going to be spent. Um, World Archery has their requisition in. We just haven't processed the paperwork. So I expect a majority of that 30,000 to be spent. So even in, a, in a pretty tough year for special events, we still spent about 110,000 of the $200,000 appropriation for hotel motel grants. As far as 2021 goes, um, again, this council or this committee recommended approving 185,000 so that there was some money left on the sidelines for reappropriation later in the year. That is a conversation I want to start tonight so that we can have um, the type of conversation you want to have in May. Um, year to date, we've had no spending out of these grants. Um, an update on what has occurred that the two spring HDBA events have been canceled, but they're uh, planning on scheduling additional events in the summer. So there's no budgetary reduction in their ask. In fact, I've heard that they might be back to ask for additional money to hold even more events than, than those two. So at this point, there's no, there's no canceled events to unappropriate or anything of that nature. But I wanted to discuss the process and what you would like to see at that future committee meeting in order to award the remaining $15,000. Um, did you want another application process? Did you want uh, groups to be required to attend, optional attendance, no attendance. What's your preference there? Um, 
I think, and Andy and Greg, feel free to hop in if, if I'm remembering this wrong, but I, I think what we decided was that um, for those events that um, had not occurred yet as we get into the May timeframe, but that had applied and we didn't award their the full amount that they had asked for, that those would be the ones that we'd be looking at um, in terms of, of kind of doling out that remaining 15,000. Does that match your memories, guys? Yeah, um, kind of similar to the NCA conversation, when you only meet a couple times a year, it's hard to, uh, Christina clearly has a very good memory. Um, it would be, I think, I, I kind of have grown to expect certain things from you, Matt, and you always deliver on the things that I'm looking for. <laughs> so it would be more or less a refresher of all of the applicants that we looked at last year, what they asked for, what we gave them, the ones that we didn't give them the full amount, as Christina just said, we could true them up. But now that we're, wh whenever that meeting is, what events were planned but did not occur, and therefore what grant money was left unused. So there's unused money in addition to the um, 14558 that we didn't grant. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I think the other piece of that, Andy, is we um, also talked about um, potentially doing that in an ongoing fashion because there do tend to be some, some folks that end up not using the money that we that we grant to them. Um, I think we said June or July. Yep, something like that, May or June, whenever that meeting is. Okay, so it sounds like yeah, and I think yeah, and I think I think we agreed that we really wanted them to be present, or if we're still online to appear online, it it's pretty meaningful when they when they show up, Thank especially you. for this, because you know, would you like a and a new application or a short application referring to the ask or just come forward and, and talk about the gap between what you were awarded and asked and just fill that in. Just the gap. I don't think we need any more. We have all the information in the original application. Okay. No reason to make them jump through even more hoops. We've all had enough hoops this past you know 12 months, so. Okay, well, we can we can certainly follow through on that and bring that forward in June. Um, we're going to have the visit Dublin, Ohio and arts council discussion in May so that yep. you can take council action in June, um, because at least in visit Dublin, Ohio's, uh, case, the, the subsidy expires at the end of June. So that they, they would need, um, some additional guidance there. Or we would need some guidance towards them on, on that issue. Yeah. And yeah. then Matt, I think, uh, as we get, um, maybe into the summer, um, prior to when the traditional bed tax applications are received, which is usually, we usually have that meeting in November. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to put on one of our agenda uh, to talk about um, the future of this process as well as the future of the amount, because we did not really have a good opportunity this past year, even though we wanted to, to talk about is $200,000 the right amount. Um, we, we decided to put that off because of how uncertain everything was. So I think we need to put that back on the agenda for the summer fall time frame. Absolutely. We we will I have that as a follow-up conversation to to have this year. Excellent. Thank you. Andy or Greg, any other comments, questions, thoughts about this? No, I no, I'm good. I, I do think people need to commit. You know, at, at the end of the day, we are uh subsidizing uh, events with taxpayers' dollars. So, right. you know, going through that formal process is a good idea. It keeps us uh, focused on it and it keeps them engaged. And, and I think that's what we need to do with tax dollars. Agreed. All right. We are on to our last item on our agenda, which is the gasoline and permissive tax revenue discussion. Yeah, so I wanted to uh, spend a little bit of time touching base today on permissive taxes as part of our first discussion, we talked about the uh, millage, and that's really the largest lever that you have that's essentially kind of available. That that lever, is, as we previously discussed, is about a $4 million lever, of which about $850,000 may or may not be available relatively soon for, for um, discussion. 
So this is another lever that exists in the capital improvements fund. And it's about a $500,000 discussion and conversation we can have. Um, I'll just cut to the point on this. There is no staff recommendation regarding these fees. I just thought um, we should have this conversation for education and discussion purposes and, and uh, to increase awareness about revenue sources that are available to the city and available to council, particularly some of the larger ones like this, where there's um, again, about $500,000 available if council were to take every action available to them. Um, the permissive taxes are taxes on vehicle registrations that are levied according to taxing districts. So these are when you fill out your license plate renewals. That's what I think of. And this is the, there will be a fee attached to your license plate renewals and your taxing district is identified by your county and municipal or township residency. So those are the two components that goes into that. Dublin is therefore located in three taxing districts, one for each county that the city is located in. Within those counties, um, and this information has changed. I wanted to point out that council discussed this at a council meeting in June of 2019 when the legislature was making some changes. Uh, it was during the gas tax discussion. So gas taxes increased uh, pretty significantly as part of that discussion. And in the transportation bill, they also created a new $5 permissive tax fee. So at that time, when we were discussing gas taxes, we were also discussing this permissive fee. And at that time, um, Union County was levying no permissive taxes and Delaware County was levying 10. So since that discussion in uh, June of 2019, Union County and Delaware County have both increased their taxes. And uh, Franklin County was already at the maximum in 2019. So theirs remains unchanged. Um, it's important to note that the current permissive tax maximum for any registration year um, is $30. And the registration year uh, for taxing purposes is identical to the state fiscal year. So any fees begin in July and end in June. So it doesn't matter when the city would take action, the Bureau of Motor Vehicles would institute that fee the following July, uh, assuming that the resolution was received in a timely manner to begin a July uh, increase. For the purposes of this, it's important to know that permissive taxes are heavily restricted funds. I mean, they are based on vehicle registrations, so they have to be used for planning, constructing, improving, maintaining public roads, highways, and repair of uh, bridges and viaducts. So these are not general operating dollars. They are road work dollars. It's also important, I think, to note that the city of Dublin spends a significant amount of our general operating dollars on road work. So to the extent that these fees would be increased and we use these restrictive dollars, we could free up unrestricted CIP dollars or general fund dollars as the case may be. Um, so there is an opportunity there. The current fund balance in fund 231, which is our permissive tax fund is just under $300,000. Uh, the current revenue to this fund is a little over $100,000 a year, and the expenditures from this fund are actually between one and $200,000 um, in the next few years, given that fund balance for the repayment of an advance from the capital improvement fund to this fund in 2016 for the relocated Rings Road project. Um, it's also called the Churchman Road project. In total, this fund owes the CIP fund about $1.9 million, so it's tied up for the better remainder of my career, essentially at current revenue levels. I did, uh, this is a very busy chart and I'm sorry that it's so complicated, but I promise you that this is the easiest way to explain it, which shows just some of the difficulty here. As I said, the maximum fee is $30 per district. There are actually 11 $5 fees, only six of which can be active at any one time. The two fees I have not shown on here our township specific fees, because we can't levy them, we can't collect them. I, I didn't feel it was in, important to discuss them. So there are nine fees on this chart and I, it's kind of color coded by fee. Um, the, this is Franklin County. And if you look, there's ORC sections that permit the county or the municipality to level a fee. And if that fee is levied, then the other jurisdiction is essentially frozen out from levying that fee. So, for example, the $5 fee that the county can levy under uh, 0.02, the municipality can levy under 0.06, but if the county acts first, then the city cannot act. It's an either or. 
and whoever moves first essentially is the winner on on the fee distribution relative to that fee. Um, so the fact that Franklin County has already taken action with regard to their ability to levy this fee means the city really can't take, we could approve a fee under this, but it wouldn't be levied. We wouldn't receive any revenue, so we wouldn't take that action. So we are basically precluded from, from taking a permissive fee under 0.06. So I kind of lay that out in the potential actions available to local government. So there's not much we can do in terms of Franklin County in the fees that the municipality and the county share because Franklin County has levied them all. With regard to some municipality specific fees, there are two $5 fees that we can we can enact um, that would bring our total from 20 to $30 in that taxing district. Each $5 fee in this taxing district would esti uh, generate an estimated $200,000. So um, that going back to this, this uh, previous slide here for a second, you saw that our fund balance revenue here is a, just over hundred thousand dollars per year. That is 100 that is almost purely a function of this uh, Franklin County levying the fee under point um, one five where 50% of the fee goes to the county and 50% of the fee goes to the municipality. So Franklin County levied this fee and now the city of Dublin receives 50% of this revenue or about a hundred thousand dollars from Franklin County annually subsequent to our share of this of this fee. It's important to note that Franklin County is the only county that levies a fee under 0.02. And there are a lot of kind of um, nuances to that, um, which are probably why no other county has levied it. And that is that 100% of the money goes to the county, but the cities can request a portion of this revenue. And I wanted to, to talk about that a little bit because what Franklin County does is they actually collect this money, but then they earmark it for Dublin Road projects. So the Franklin County engineer has an account uh, in their, on their books that is earmarked for city of Dublin road projects. And what happens is the finance office identifies eligible projects. And then we will call the Franklin County engineer, find out what the fund balance is, write up a letter requesting the reimbursement and submit that as though it was similar to a grant, um, et cetera. The last time we went through this process was we received about $590,000 in 2016, again, for that Churchman Road project. We have an available balance of $817,000 on, um, on the books with the Franklin County engineer. So historically, what we've done is $200,000 a year is, is not a small amount of money, except when you're talking about roadway projects. So we generally, every four or five years, let it get between 600 and a million dollars and then request enough money to make a substantial contribution to an eligible road project. And these eligible road projects are generally county feeder roads. There's a, it's usually a larger road that we would, we would impact. And we have a list and I can supply that if you're interested, but it's generally a large, a larger road project that's involved. Are there any questions on that fee? That's the only county that levies this type of fee. No, it sounds like we're uh, due to ask for that money at this point, though. Yeah, we're getting close. Next, next CIP, I'm going to take a look at it. So Delaware County, there's a little bit more. Um, again, they levy a $15 fee, and the county has taken action on all the fees that are 100% um, to the county or the municipality. Again, the city of Dublin does receive about $10,000 annually from Delaware County under that dot 15 fee where we receive 50%. So we are receiving that revenue. Uh, they don't levy the fee under the dot 02 ordinance. So there's nothing to request. There's nothing earmarked there. It's not levied. Um, basically the city has available to it five fees that we could levy. And if we were to do that, we would generate $20,000 per, uh, per fee. Union County um, looks very similar to Delaware County. And this is very recent. As I said, in June of 19, it was actually $0. Now it's $15. And looking at the revenue reports, they've just begun collecting that um, in July of 2021 because the revenue doesn't come in until, uh, or 2020. The revenue reports didn't show them receiving anything until August of 2020. So these are very, very new fees. Um, 
Again, they're not levying the fee under O2, so there is nothing on reserve with Union County. And we have started to receive some money under the dot one five levying at this point. It's 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 been hundreds of dollars or less per per month. So we haven't budgeted it, but we'll we'll see what that amounts to moving forward. And again, if the city were to take action on these fees, it would be about fifteen thousand dollars annually uh, per fee. So all told, I just wanted to kind of, you know, illuminate that the city has the ability to levy additional permissive tax fees on vehicle registrations. The fees collections always begin on July 1st, which is the start of the state fiscal year. If the city levied all available fees annually, we would generate a little over $500,000 based on um, the two fees available in Franklin County and the three fees available in other counties. And just you know, for recommendations, should anybody, you know, want to know why we're talking about this for discussion and awareness. And there is no staff recommendation at this point regarding these these fee revenues. And with that, I'm available for any questions. Greg, Andy. I, get, I mean, I, I greatly appreciate all the information, Matt, and this is the kind of stuff that um, we're so fortunate to have the quality of a finance director that pays attention to all those sort of things for me. And this is just for me. I stop at a philosophical point going down the road of, you know, for it would for me, it would be it would be raising taxes. You know, it's five dollars and you can make it five cents. For me, it's the philosophy of reaching into a person's pocket who earned that money and taking it from them. And um, I get it that it's available. We can do it. We have the ability to do it. We have bills. We could certainly pay with it. But we live in a community that is so incredibly blessed to be. And I know that it is due to uh, decades and generations of hard work and uh, fiscal responsibility and conservative budgeting and all of that stuff. I know why. I know why we are where we are. But we are also blessed to be there. And for me, um, I would need a. If there were a project, if, if, for example, we were living in a community where we were starting to contract our projects. Or we were faced with struggling to, uh, you know, fund new police officers or things like that, where we were really struggling. Um, I would think, okay, well, we need to find other sources of funds. Um, this doesn't seem to me to be that kind of a thing. So I get it. I understand the, the, the reason to think it through just for me and the four corners of my own mind. I don't necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily be comfortable raising those taxes, no matter how small or large they are, um, given the overall financial health of this community. That, that I guess I've said enough. That's, that's what I think. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, I agree with Greg. I, I, I do think it's interesting that it's more expensive in Franklin County than the other two. So I suppose you could make an argument that you could equalize the, the others, but it's just not, it's raising taxes and it's not worth the effort and the angst. So I would just leave it alone. Yeah, I think that um, in addition to, to that, um, like I said before, 2021 is a year of, of transition and trying to figure out what post pandemic finance budget is going to look like next year. I don't want to. I don't want to start to pull so many levers that we end up thinking, gee, we probably didn't need to do that 1. Right? We, we've still got to figure out what's going to happen with the 20 day rule. We've got to figure out. You know, what's happening with the next round of, um, of, of COVID relief that's that's coming to the city. I just feel like we have a lot of moving parts that, you know, frankly, tax philosophy aside, it's just not the right time to do it. Um, although I would argue that my philosophy is fairly well in alignment with with both yours, Greg and Andy. Um, but uh, it's just to me, it doesn't feel like the right time to do anything. Although I really appreciate the education on the permissive tax. It's super, super helpful to understand the breakdown of it. Um, and when you spend really just a few minutes with these charts that you put together, Matt, it's actually really clear what's available to us and what's not. So uh, for me, it was super helpful from an education standpoint. And I really, really appreciate you putting it together. Sure, no, I, I appreciate that. And I'm certainly happy to put this this to bed and, and move on to the next next topic. That's good direction. So I appreciate that. 
Yeah, I think Matt, it's always fair every couple of years, bring it up, right? Um, there are lots of different things that happen year over year. I think this is one of those things that should be on a little bit of a regular cadence um, in terms of bringing in front of this committee. Matt, I have a quick question about the um, motor vehicle fuel tax. Sure. And it's just really more curiosity than anything else. 2020, the revenues were higher than 2019. How do you, is that because the taxes went up by enough to compensate for fewer people driving? Yeah, the, the gas tax went up by 40%. Okay. So that was a remarkable increase in, in revenue, uh, frankly, it went up from 28 to 38, I think. 38, so, yeah, 38 and a half. So that, that, that increase was, was substantial and, and actually, um, you know, we started to see that increase in 2019. You'll see 2019 was a pretty big jump from 18 because the gas tax actually went into effect in July of that year. It's delayed two months. So we got four months of that increase and that moved the needle pretty substantially in 2019. 2020, we saw the largest drop in gas volume ever in March and April. I mean, it was unbelievable as, as we all lived through, um, but then everything bounced back. And as soon as it bounced back, our conservative budgeting philosophy, we were right on target of, of where we budgeted. So given that we're not going to lock down March, April style in 21, I hope, right? We're not gonna do that. Um, we should see gas tax revenues increase in 21 over 2020's number, you know, by a month or two in the revenues that we lost last March and April. So Great. those revenues are going in the right direction. Great, thank you. Super good discussion. Um, you got anything else you want to uh, throw in front of us, Matt? No, I'm available for any other questions, but that's everything I have scheduled for tonight. Great. Um, Rosa and Megan, it's been really nice to have you guys with us. Um, appreciate you guys being here. Greg, do you have anything else you want to throw on the table? I do not. Thank you very much for the meeting. Very helpful. Andy. You're good. All good. Excellent. Um, Fantastic. Well, then, thanks, everybody. We will adjourn and oh, Matt's got 1 more thing. So Sorry, I do. Have, I do have 1 more thing. I don't believe we formally scheduled the meetings in April and May yet. So if you're we, right, I will send out those emails, but if we could. Uh, finalize that schedule, that's very helpful for me, particularly if we're going to go early April. Yeah, definitely for sure. Absolutely. We'll, we will. I will commit on behalf of Andy and Greg that we will all respond in a very short period of time. With our availability um, based on what you send us. Super. Thank All right. Well, you. thank you, everybody. Um, we'll stand adjourned, and I hope everybody has an excellent night. Bye. Bye. -bye.